And a very good morning to you. I hope you're well this Sunday morning. Thanks for joining me. How are you? Hope you've had a good weekend. It's Sunday morning, the 15th of April or April 15th, 2018. My name is Richie Allen and this is Sunday View, of course, where I take a look at the front pages of the country's national... The front pages of the country's national, did I say that? The country's tabloid and broadsheet newspapers. That would be a better way of putting it. Looking at the front pages of the papers, they've all got a similar theme running through them today. You won't be surprised. You can chat to me directly during the programme by tweeting at Richie Allen Show. Couldn't be simpler. At Richie Allen Show is the way to get to me. This is Sunday View then. As we do it, it's 11 o'clock live here in South Manchester, which is grim. It's Grim Oop North. Welcome to the show. Asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on RichieAllen.co.uk. Fab Radio 2 in Manchester and TriggerWarning.tv. Yeah, when is it ever not grim up north? That's what I want to know. When is it ever not grim up north? Thank you so much for joining me. A lot to talk about about Syria, of course, and the attack on the country in the last few days. On today's Sunday View, welcome to it. It's the Richie Allen Show, broadcasting live on richieallen.co.uk and multiple platforms around the world. And now, here's your host, Richie Allen. Now, if you want to have a look at the front pages of the newspapers, you've only got to go to richieallen.co.uk because I took the liberty, as I do every Sunday, of posting the front pages. You can click on them and enlarge the images if you want to do that to see what they're saying. But as I said, and you won't be surprised to learn, that every single newspaper today, the front page of every single newspaper, deals with the attack Friday night into Saturday morning by the UK, France and the United States, the attack on targets in Damascus, allegedly targets to do with the development of chemical weapons. And we're going to talk about that this morning as well. Alrighty, okay. Let's do it then. Right, we will hear from Boris Johnson, the Foreign Secretary, and Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of the opposition Labour Party. Both of them were live on the Andrew Marr show earlier today. That's the BBC's flagship Sunday political programme. Now, the BBC reports this morning, before we look at the front pages of the papers, that there were sharp exchanges at the United Nations last night. Russia tabled a motion to secure a condemnation of the airstrikes by the so-called Western powers. And Russia's United Nations, excuse me, Russia's United Nations envoy, Vasily Nebenzia, or Nebenzia, he read out a quote from President Vladimir Putin accusing the Allies of cynical disdain in acting without waiting for the results of a chemical watchdog investigation into the Duma incident. You might be aware the OPCW investigators were due to arrive in Syria today, right? Now, Bashar Jafari, who's Syria's envoy to the United Nations, he said last night that the US, UK and France were liars spoilers and hypocrites who exploited the United Nations to pursue their policy of interference and colonialism. Strong words from the Syrian envoy to the United Nations. On the 15-member council, only China and Bolivia voted in favour of Russia's resolution. US envoy Nikki Haley said the strikes were justified, legitimate and proportionate. This is the line that has been repeated over and over again over the last 48 hours. Haley said that she'd spoken to the President Saturday morning and that he'd said if the Syrian regime uses poisonous gas again, the US is locked and loaded. Haley said when our President draws a red line, our President enforces the red line. Haley said the US and its allies had given diplomacy chance after chance, but that Russia had continued to veto UN resolutions. And I'll tell you what's very interesting to me this morning, dear listener, is that one of the proposals being put forward by NATO allies, US, the US, France and the UK, is some sort of ceasefire where everybody operating in the region agrees to down weapons for a period of time. Now that, of course, would suit the so-called opposition, the so-called rebels, which in reality, as we know, are jihadi 
lunatic Wahhabists, right? Wouldn't it suit them with Assad having virtually won the war, virtually driven most of these guys into retreat or out of the country, right? Right. Ceasefire is an interesting proposal. So let's talk about the Sunday Times then. Because it's, I suppose, of all the newspapers today, it's the one being discussed most on UK television and radio this morning because they have a picture on the front page of the Sunday Times of a little girl, of a cute um, little girl, uh, it must be said, and she's being held by a woman in a niqab, I think, or in a burqa. And the headline on the front page of the Sunday Times, all of the pictures are on richieallen.co.uk. The headline is, The Little Girl Whose Agony Set the West on Path to War. It's a big human interest story. What this is, basically, is the Sunday Times claims to have an exclusive. It claims, as a newspaper, to be the first publication to interview victims of the alleged chemical attack from last week. So they've got plenty of pictures of children and survivors describing what they witnessed and the the descriptions are very graphic descriptions of the stench of chlorine gas and panic and and all of that. So that's on the Sunday Times today. Now Andrew Marr had Christiane Amanpour from CNN and Fraser Nelson from The Spectator on his sofa to review the Sunday newspapers. The journalist Rachel Shabby was also there, but Rachel didn't get much of a look in. Listen to Christiane Amanpour and Fraser Nelson discussing the front page of the Sunday Times, the picture of that girl and the graphic descriptions of what it's like when you... um, when you are victim of a chemical attack. Christiane Amanpour, Fraser Nelson, and I think you'll hear Andrew Marr too. Front page of the Sunday Times is where you wanted to start. Well, I do think this is important. You mentioned a good old-fashioned piece of reportage, and it's really important to get to right at the ground and granular level about this kind of story and not just look at it from 30,000 feet up. These are the victims of this man, and they have been for the last seven years, with conventional war and weapons and with chemical weapons. And we shouldn't forget that these people are being aggressed on a daily basis by this man. And I have interviewed him, and many of you remember when he first came to power, believed that he would be the young reformer of the Middle East. He's married to a nice British ophthalmologist and all the rest of it. Absolutely, absolutely. And of course, then we have the Arab Spring. Why was it okay for the Egyptians to rise up and get rid of their dictator who did much less to his people than Assad and somehow it's not okay for the Syrians to want some kind of reform. That's what started this war. So you think that was when he changed as a person or he from flipped what I, back to the old what, Assad? From what I have heard from people who grew up with him, who know him, who yes he was the younger son, he wasn't the heir, he came accidentally because his brother was mm. killed, but he like his brothers and his father were born ruthless. And it never changed, and he was always like that. This is staggering stuff, this, isn't it? None of it is being challenged by Andrew Marr. This guy was a reluctant president. He was in Syria in place of his dead brother. He was doing a fairly okay job. The United Nations were really happy with the millennial goals. There was no problem. Then the Arab Spring came along, says Christiane Amanpour. And why was it okay for us to you know, condemn and get involved in what happened in Egypt and not get involved in what happened in Syria. This guy was born ruthless, Assad. This is crap, folks. This is real crap, you know. And the very least the presenter should do there is jump in and say, well, why is he ruthless? What are you talking about? Things were hunky-dory there for a decade or, or more. What's going on? But it goes on, and then Fraser Nelson in a minute or so will jump in and join in if it isn't good enough what Amanpour is doing. Like that. Let's just go back. You talk about the granular detail of what happens. The, I think the important thing about this report um, by Louise Callahan is that she's down in the... She talks about being in the basement. Yes. You're cowering in a basement, and suddenly you hear these strange popping noises from above, and you go out to look at it, and it's gas, yeah. and the terror, and all the, the strength in your body kind of flows out, and you stumble and you fall. It's the actual detail of what and a gas really is And it's really important like. to know that, because let's face it, in 1925, there was the International Convention Against Chemical Weapons. And Saddam, sorry, Saddam Hussein, of course he did it. He was yep. the first 
But Bashar Assad for seven years has been doing this with impunity and he's normalized the use of chemical weapons. Do we want to live in that kind of mm. world? Do we? And the, the other reason this is so important is that um, Russia will always deny it, Assad will always deny it. So how do you demonstrate that chemical weapons were used? Now when the United Nations have done this, they've documented something like 30 or 40 attempts by Assad using chemical weapons. You need to put people on the ground to talk to the survivors, to have them describe, to see if their accounts corroborate. And the, Sunday, and the Sunday Times the has done this. Of chlorine in this exactly. Well, not just that, blood samples, urine mm -hmm. samples, they've done a good deal of homework so in the Sunday Times yeah, so and the New York Times. Thanks to this report, there can be really no doubt now that chemical weapons were used and also that Assad's regime is the only outfit mm -hmm. capable of using them. That's incredible, isn't it? According to Fraser Nelson, because of a story in the Sunday Times, which claims to be based around interviews with survivors of this chemical attack last week by a Sunday Times journalist who is in uh, Eastern Ghouta, who's in Douma. Based on all of that, based on that story, Fraser Nelson says there can now be no doubt whatsoever that the regime man used those weapons on those people. This is just rubbish, this. It's just rubbish. It's patently rubbish. And it's pretty, it's pretty obvious what's going on here in terms of what the media is doing. Speaking of the media, did the media have advanced knowledge of the attack? Detailed knowledge. I had a phone call from um, a journalist in, in the US who makes a program similar to this program in the US makes um, an alternative or an independent radio show asked me on Friday would I um, would, would I come on and comment on his program about the Major General Jonathan Shaw interview on Sky News on Friday and I turned him down not, not, not that I'm in the habit of turning people down I don't do that I'm a pretty amiable guy and I pretty much do most of what people ask me to do but at the weekend I just I'm not getting involved in I do, I do enough in the week without doing it so I politely declined but we had a little chat about it and I said yeah well th the conduct of Samantha Washington on Sky News on Friday afternoon when she interviewed a very senior retired Major General a guy called Jonathan Shaw Major General Jonathan Shaw and he came on to Sky News just after Alexander Yakovenko, the Russian ambassador to London, had given another speech criticising the the claims made by the US and France and the UK and all of that. So she brought on Major General Jonathan Shaw and her conduct with him and what happened to him is one of the more blatant examples of the things that I discuss all the time on this programme, how the media operates. Major General Jonathan Shaw, former commander of British troops in Iraq, very, very senior, doesn't get much more senior, was throwing some doubt on the idea that Assad would have had any reason to use the weapons. And then he was abruptly cut off. Now, I'm thinking there's a good chance you have seen this and heard it already, but I know there are people who won't have heard it. So I'm going to play it again. This is Sam Samantha Washington, Sky News presenter, introducing former major, well, he's, he's always a major general, isn't he? Former army, you know, top man, Jonathan Shaw. Listen to how it went down. OK, Tom, thank you very much. Well, we're joined now by Major General Jonathan Shaw. He's a former commander of British forces in Iraq. Um, thank you very much for your patience. I know we kept you waiting. That press conference has uh, gone on a long while, hasn't it? I'm just uh, interested, first of all, uh, in, your, in your interpretation of what you heard there from Alexander Yakimbenko. Yes, a fascinating double denial of, of both events. Um, I think the, uh, to an extent, utterly to be expected, and uh, if you're looking at the consistent theme of modern news where nothing is now certain, everything is potentially fake, everything is up for challenge, I think it was entirely consistent with that. As your previous uh, interviewer said, uh, a lot of effort being put into muddy the waters and make sure that no one has a clear picture of what's going on. So in that sense, an utterly consistent and predictable set of responses.
Uh, sowing a lot of doubt or attempting to sow doubt um, about the intelligence that would underpin uh, some rationale for military intervention in Syria. Do you think anything what we've heard from either Sergei Lavrov or indeed the Russian ambassador has made it more difficult for the UK to launch any kind of attack without putting it to Parliament? Yeah, I, don't, I think quite apart from all that, the, the, the debate that seems to be missing from this is, uh, and this was actually mentioned by the, by the, uh, the ambassador, was what possible motive might have uh, triggered Syria to launch a chemical attack at this time in this place? Uh, you know, the Syrians are winning. Don't take my word for it. Take the American military's word for it. General Vergel, the head of uh, CENTCOM, you know, he said to Congress the other day, America, uh, Assad has won this war and we need to face that. So, and then, then you got last week the, the statement by Trump or a tweet by Trump that, that America had finished with ISIL and we we're going to pull out soon, very soon. Uh, and then suddenly you get... OK, I'm, 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 I'm very sorry. You've been uh, very patient waiting for us, but we do need to leave it there. I'm very sorry. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, more to come on Sky News. Do stay tuned. Now, Sky News told the Daily Mirror that the reason for that was because there was a hard break scheduled at around 26 minutes past the hour. And that in the second half hour of the hour programme, I know, I could explain it a bit better. The way Sky operates these days is there is a half hour of news followed by a half hour of some feature stuff. Lately, it's a lot of environmentally friendly, friendly stuff, anti-plastic in the ocean campaigns, and but a lot of interviews, a lot of more you know in-depth interviews with to do with stuff that doesn't really matter. So Sky's response to the mirror was there was a hard break scheduled into a pre-recorded section of the program that was ready to go, hence cutting off the general. But I don't buy it, and I've worked in television, I've presented television, I will present television again real soon. I've been in the gallery watching directors and producers as they are directing and producing other people's programmes just so I could get a feel for what it is they are doing so that I wouldn't be impatient with them when I'm in front of the camera, right? <laughs> Not that I ever was. Nobody would ever say that about me anyway. Not that I'm an angel, but I was never impatient with the gallery. Never. So I don't buy it because his microphone was faded down before she jumped in fairly ashen-faced and very nervously cut him off. I don't believe for a minute that a man of that stature, a man of his experience, former commander of British forces in Iraq, would only be afforded a couple of minutes. I think what would have happened, what was likely to happen, if they were concerned about the hard break into the second half hour of the programme, somebody would have said to him off air, listen, Jonathan, we're really up against it here. Can we get you on early in the next hour? After three o'clock or four o'clock, can we do that and we'll, we'll have a bit more time? That's what happens. I've produced programmes, real programmes, professional programmes for years. And been, as I said, been on the other side of it. So they cut him off blatantly because he was saying something which was harmful. And I believe they cut him off because Murdoch and Murdoch's minions at The Sun, at Sky News, at The Times, they had foreknowledge that there would be an attack on Syria later that night. And it, knowing that, what the general was saying was potentially very harmful, knowing the attack was coming later on. It's a glaring example of what I've talked about for years, but you don't often see it so blatant as that where the guy is basically cut off in his prime. It's, it's, it's not shocking to me, because I watch it every day, I listen to it every day, I have been for many years, but um, it is what it is. And I think it lends to the notion that the media knew. Now, I mentioned a minute ago that the Prevention of, chemi of Chemical Weapons, the Organisation for the Prevention of Chemical Weapons, the OPCW, their inspectors were due in Syria today to start their investigation. You, you'll remember the Syrians and the Russians said, look, you'll be left unmolested to carry out your investigations. Why didn't the UK wait, let the OPCW team in and then wait for their report? 
Well, Deputy Chairman of the Conservative Party, James Cleverly, was on Sky News this morning. This is a senior Tory. And he was asked by Stephen Dixon, why didn't we wait? Well, the uh, the inspectors from the uh, IPCW uh, have been in Syria a number of times and they have confirmed in the past um, the use of chemical weapons by the Assad regime. Uh, there have been attempts to get... Uh, decisions through the United Nations, attempts which have been thwarted by Russia uh, using its veto. And the attempt by Russia to get the UN to criticise this decision was was thrown out by virtually uh, all the member states involved. So there is international support for the action that the Prime Minister has uh, taken in conjunction with international allies. This is a direct, proportionate an appropriate response to the illegal use of chemical weapons by the Assad regime. It is a fair question though, isn't it, by, by people like Jeremy Corbyn to say why, why couldn't this decision, even if it wasn't taken by, by, um, by the Commons, uh, put forward for a, a vote in that sense, why was there a need to act before those weapons inspectors went in today? Well, as I say, I don't have uh, access to, m m only the people sitting around the cabinet table have access to the uh, the full intelligence briefing so so i don't know exactly what was in them but without a shadow of a doubt i trust uh, the prime minister's judgment on this and the judgment of the uh, the cabinet uh, as do the international community we've heard voices from around the world from from canada denmark the netherlands the european union yeah yeah the european union the netherlands new zealand all, and all of that garbage stephen dixon asked them a great question I would have phrased it a bit differently to Stephen Dixon because maybe sometimes I'm a little bit more immature than maybe I should be. But I would have said, excuse me, Mr. Cleverly, if a crime scene, right, if we have established a crime scene, it's there, and we say that chemical weapons were deployed there, isn't it reasonable to assume that... Any party who seeks to destroy the crime scene just before the investigators get there, that party might very well be the party responsible for the chemical weapons deployment in the first place. Do you get where I'm going with this, Mr. Cleverly? The inspectors were just about to get there. Bang, the whole thing was blown up. <laughs> you have to conclude... That maybe the people behind the attacks or maybe those who wanted to keep the inspectors from finding out what was really going on there. Did Cleverly say anything else of any interest? I don't think so. The European Union, NATO, Australia, New Zealand, supporting the decisions that have been uh, made uh, over the weekend. And it is worth understanding that in sometimes fast-moving situations where we are looking to avert a, human, a humanitarian catastrophe... <coughs> that sometimes decisions need to be made quite quickly, action needs to be taken promptly, uh, and that is what we have seen over the weekend. No, that's nonsense. The inspectors were due to go in today. That is absolute nonsense. But there you go. We'll take a very quick break. When we come back, I'll give you the rest of the headlines, because they're all the same, really. And I'm going to read a little bit of an article written by Peter Hitchens in the Mail on Sunday today. It's a very good piece by Hitchens. And then we'll hear from people like Senator Richard Black, the Virginia State Senator who's been on this programme a few times. We'll definitely hear from the Foreign Secretary, Boris Johnson, and also from Jeremy Corbyn. This is Sunday View, your Sunday View, live on richieallen.co.uk, Fab Radio 2 in Manchester, and of course, triggerwarning.tv, TuneIn Radio, and all the rest of it. The programme is archived on Spotify, iTunes, Podomatic, where it has been the most downloaded and listened to podcast in current affairs for three years now. How bad is that, eh? Back in two minutes. Introducing the H2O app, a powerful water structure and application that programs vibrational energies into water through the use of different sound frequencies. Once programmed, the use of water for drinking, cooking, bathing. Give it to your friends and colleagues or spread it around the garden. The list goes on. It's not just water that the app can be used for either. It's great for programming crystals too. The H2O app is free to download and is available on both Android and Apple platforms. For further information, go to h2oapp.online. 
Have you lost access to important data from a computer hard drive, mobile phone, or other storage device? Maybe you have a broken hard drive containing years of information, or a smartphone that no longer works from which you'd like the pictures, movies, and chats recovered. If you would like to recover data from any type of digital device, including desktop and laptop computers, external hard drives, cameras, smartphones, NAS, and RAID servers, then contact Data Clinic today at dataclinic.co.uk now. There's a place high in the mountains of Spain, a sanctuary where souls gather from all around the globe to learn about themselves and experience powerful changes in the way we see our world. They become awakened to their gifts and their power to heal others. Become part of this ever-growing worldwide family of unique, pure energy healing practitioners. Discover how amazing you truly are. Go to www. Markbayerski.com. It could just change your life forever. The Richie Allen Show relies on your support. Go to richieallen.co.uk and set up a monthly donation today. Welcome back to the most listened to independent radio show in Europe. It's your Richie Allen Show. Welcome back to Sunday View, 26 minutes past 11. As it's live, you might be getting the podcast. Thanks for downloading the podcast. Thanks for listening to it on YouTube. Thank you, Simon Stewart, for all the work you do on YouTube during the week. Jason tweets, listening to the politicians, Richie, and the journalists. I guess we're lucky to live in a digital age as there isn't a storage facility large enough to hold the, no doubt, voluminous paper-based control files the intelligence services have on them. Yes. Yes, I like the cartoon, drunk, staggering, ruthless and evil. How many people with those qualities want to go become doctors and eye surgeons like Assad was? A very good point. Is that Good morning to John Smith. Good morning to David Stanford who says it's all about the minerals. Good morning to Kim Erswell. How are you doing, Kim? Good morning. Good morning to Terence Howell uh, and uh, to Rich who says, bizarre they didn't wait for an inspection. And even more bizarre how that pipeline runs through Syria bypassing Russia indeed hi to Ruth good morning Ruth and to Jackie in Oz how you doing Jackie it's getting late in Oz isn't it late Sunday evening there thanks for listening to Andy Jerry as well keep the tweets coming in it's at Richie Allen show on Twitter it's at Richie Allen Bill Wilson tweets good morning Bill I've tried watching Sky News a few times recently I can't do it Richie I just want to put my boot through the TV the lying bastards There might be a bit of therapy in that, Bill, but I do suggest you buy a very old television that doesn't cost much money and kick the absolute bejesus out of it. It it, it might. Make sure it's plugged out first, though. It it makes sure it's plugged out. It might actually have some sort of therapeutic uh, value to it. Connington. I'm going to say it. Lord Twat Waffle. (laughs) Oh, Jesus. Good morning. Joining you from Tasmania, Australia, Richie. Great to catch a live show. Thank you very much. It's nice to know. It's nice to know. My great friend Jean Ann Crowley has been tweeting, not tweeting me, sending me messages this morning as well. Um, somebody got in touch with Jean Ann to say that they um, were listening to the programme in America or from France even and connecting with people who were listening to the programme in America. It's nice. The programme does have a pretty um, big reach. We do, we do um, have people listening in pretty much every part of the world and that's nice. Nothing narcissistic about that. It's just nice. It's nice to know that people are listening. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad. Base Ninja makes a good point. May said the rebels don't fly helicopters. With all the funding we've sent, is it reasonable to think they could buy them? I'd even speculate that choppers of US, UK, Israeli, Saudi special forces have been used to assist the rebels. I have no doubt. Andy tweets, yeah, we're going to get Chilcot 2, the sequel, Return of the Killer May. This time there's going to be a complete whitewash and you'll have no way out. Suck on that, UK, says Andy. Danny Ward in tweets, good afternoon, Richie. Did the coalition actually bomb Duma, destroying all the evidence? I was led to believe they only bombed strategic sites only. That's a good question, Danny. I don't know. But there are some claims that the site of the alleged attack has been bombed. Then again, the so-called, let's call them the coalition, 
the US, the UK and France, they're alleging that the Russians went in and removed evidence so that the inspectors wouldn't have found anything anyway. There's all sorts of claims. Of course, this is what Major General Jonathan Shaw was actually saying, to be fair to him. Everybody is muddying the waters. Everybody. Dean Smith tweets that anyone see where Nikki Haley walked out of a conference just before a Syrian representative could pose the question as to why she's an arrogant psycho, says Dean. Right, let's have a look at that article in The Mail on Sunday by Peter Hitchens. I'm not going to read all of it. He starts off talking about how he toured a hospital in Bucharest in Christmas of 1989 and the horrors he saw there, um, seeing what bullets do to the human anatomy you know, graphic, and how much it changed him. He says, there is, there are times when we must fight, but there are plenty more when we shouldn't. He says, any fool can kill a man in a second and ruin a city in a week, but it takes years of nurture to raise a child to adulthood and centuries to build a civilization. And then Hitchens writes in the Mail on Sunday today, he writes, yet I look around me and see the mouths of intelligent people opened wide, yelling for an attack on Syria when the only certain outcome of that will be blood and screams and ruins and the deaths of innocents in collateral damage. What good will this do? Asks Peter Hitchens in the Mail on Sunday. He goes on. What is wrong with them? They are not cruel and stupid, yet they call for actions which are both. Haven't we got enough misery in Syria already? The place is a mass of ruins, graveyards and refugee camps. To what end? The only mercy for Syria will come when the war ends, yet we seek to widen and extend it. Don't we have more than enough of such disaster in Iraq and Libya, where state-sponsored panic and emotional claims of atrocities excused the launching of war so stupid and dangerous that I wonder if these places can ever recover? Hitchens goes on, he writes, perhaps worse by creating an unending river of migrants through the Middle East and the Mediterranean, I suspect they have ruined Europe for good. Why are we even taking sides in Syria? As Julian Lewis MP, chairman of the Defence Select Committee, rightly pointed out last week, President Assad is a monster, monster, but his opponents are maniacs. Now, of course, I don't believe, personally, that President Assad is a monster. That's me, your presenter, right? But Hitchens is entitled to his opinion, and he believes that, fair enough. But he's being honest here, and he's being balanced. He writes the Syrian jihadi gangsters, which our government crazily helps and backs. The al-Nusra Front and Jaish al-Islam are the sort of fanatics we would arrest on sight if we found them in Birmingham. Anyway, Boris Johnson's foreign office is firmly pro-monster in all parts of the world where it suits it to be so. British royals and ministers literally bow down as they accept medals from the head-chopping fanatics of Saudi Arabia, now engaged in a bloody, aggressive war in Yemen. Very good stuff, this by Hitchens, isn't it? <clears throat> Excuse me. Even if you might be triggered by the fact that he called Assad a monster. Don't be triggered! He's entitled to his opinion. As are you, and as am I. And then he says... Do we even know that Assad used chemical weapons? I've actually read the reports of the last such alleged attack in uh, Khan Shekun a year ago, and they prove nothing. In fact, they are quite fishy. At the time of writing, I have yet to see a British or US media report on this alleged attack from closer than Beirut, 70 miles from the scene. Many seemingly confident and graphic accounts come from Istanbul, 900 miles away, or even from London or Washington. Where are they getting their information from? Here's the clue, writes Peter Hitchens. The Saudi-backed faction in control of Duma at the time of the alleged attack, Jaish al-Islam, were themselves accused of using poison gas against the Kurds in Aleppo in April 2016. They are not especially nice, writes Hitchens. Their other main claim to fame is that they displayed captured Syrian army officers in cages and use them as human shields. And finally, he writes, they have spent several years indiscriminately shelling Damascus from Duma, having taken the local inhabitants hostage and then squawking about war crimes of the Syrian government. It's very good stuff, this by Peter Hitchens, in the 
Mail on Sunday today. And to be fair to the Mail on Sunday, it has tried to provide some balance, but he's a lone voice, is Peter Hitchens. Why? Well, he is a lone voice because much of the rest of the media, or pretty much all of the rest of the media, is baying for blood. Now, David Willits is the defence editor for The Sun newspaper, another Murdoch rag. Here is David Willits on Sky News this morning. He was asked the question, what will the Russians do in response to what we've seen in uh, Syria in the last 48 hours? What will Russia do? This is the defence editor for The Sun, David Willits. I don't think we're going to get any military response no. whatsoever. No, but possibly some cyber stuff or... Maybe some cyber. I think there will be a retaliation, but it will be propaganda-based. They'll lie, they'll obfuscate, they'll do what they always do, the Russians. They'll try and accuse us. I mean, they've accused us of orchestrating the, the chemical weapons attack. I mean, nothing is beneath their craziness um, but there, there could be there could be the threat of a cyber attack maybe not now but in the months to come they've got the capability to do it we're investing more in our defenses so but i think they're over i don't know that it's there is always a gamble when you do this sort of stuff but it was i think it was the, the, the odds were good and i think we've got it i think we've got the balance right between dealing with the syrian regime and saying you can't do this and not provoking not cornering russia into a position where they had to respond militarily i think it was going to escalate it would have happened would have happened by, by now. now would have happened by now would have happened yes. by now as frankie goes to hollywood so rightly predicted <laughs> in their song which baffled everybody earlier yeah, baffled me. <laughs> now i baffled got the me. reference when you yeah it's all a good laugh it's all a good laugh people are getting killed and people's lives are in danger maybe millions of people that was liz kershaw by the way often described as salt of the earth yeah, yeah, right. Virginia State Senator Dick Black mentioned Dick earlier on. He's been on with me and will be on with me again soon. Richard Black, Dick, as he's known, Dick says it's childishly absurd to claim that Assad ordered the chemical attack because he was in the ascendancy. We do not know whether chemicals were used or whether this was just a fabrication. And if they were used, we have no earthly idea who used them. Um, but we do know just logically there was no motive whatsoever for uh, Syria to do it. First of all, they had conquered Jaish al-Islam in Douma, and they were already shipping them out on buses. Uh, Jaish al-Islam had burned their own tanks. They were shredding uh, documents and so forth. They were leaving. They were finished. The war was, the, the battle for Douma was over. And so the idea that at that precise point uh, gas would be fired is, is it's childishly absurd. Yeah, it is childishly absurd. It doesn't make any sense at all. In, in fact, you know, w without being able to claim anything as 100% fact, because that would be unfair, because I can't be 100% certain of anything, but I would say there's a 99.999% chance that nobody on the orders of Bashar al-Assad has used chemical weapons against Syrian civilians. I wouldn't believe it for a minute. Now, has the Syrian army, have Syrian government forces, have they committed crimes against the civilian population? The answer is undoubtedly. And this is what the snowflakes in the so-called independent media, this is what they can't come to terms with. The fact that not everything is black and white. Assad is on the right side of history when it comes to what's happening in the region in general, not just in Syria. And the Russians are right to back him. Right? But the idea that the Syrian army have not done unspeakable things to people that they've arrested or captured, people whom they suspect are colluding with Western-backed jihadists, it's ridiculous and absurd to think that they wouldn't be or, and haven't done bad things. I've seen things on LiveLeak.com and these aren't videos presented by CNN or by the BBC. Th th this is raw footage coming out of places over the years. It's not black and white, you see, right? But, but I wouldn't imagine, in fact, again, I would say I'm 99.99% sure that the Assad family and the Assad government, they've not told... Syrian soldiers to go and commit crimes against people. But it's an, it's, it's an inevitability in conflict. Every side of it. Everybody ultimately becomes guilty of heinous crimes against their fellow man. Right? There's no doubt in my mind about that. But um, 
Richard Black is right. Assad virtually wiped out these guys. No need whatsoever to be launching weapons, let alone chemical weapons, but any weapons against people as these guys were being bussed out of the city and taken away. Now, I mentioned earlier on, Andrew Marr had Jeremy Corbyn, the Labour leader, and Boris Johnson, the Foreign Secretary, on his programme this morning. Shall we hear from Boris Johnson first? I think we should do. Uh, not because he has any seniority in my, in my mind, but let's hear from him first. Marr asked Boris Johnson to explain the strikes. You know, what was it all about? Why did we do it? Johnson's answer, as in Boris Johnson's answer, is so rehearsed, it's so polished, that I decided to cheekily set it to a little bit of music. Shouldn't do this really, but what the hell, it's Sunday view. Johnson's answer is hilariously rehearsed and practised. Let's have a listen to it. So Mar says to him, OK then, Foreign Secretary, what happened that led up to this and what did we achieve, what did we do Friday and Saturday. This is Bojo. There's one overwhelming reason why this was the right thing to do, and that is to deter the use of chemical weapons, not just by the Assad regime, but around the world. And I think one of the most distressing things about the events of the last few years has been the growth, the contemptuous growth in the use of uh, chemical weapons uh, in the, the Syrian theatre of conflict. And you can imagine uh, that people around the world are looking now and saying, well, finally, someone stood up against that. And the world said, enough uh, to the use of such weapons. It's one of the great achievements of the modern world that we've banned uh, chemical weapons. A hundred years, virtually, uh, that prohibition has been there. And now the UK, France, America have stepped forward to vindicate that. Jerusalem. Lovely stuff by Boris there, huh? We are so very virtuous. They are so very evil. We stood up and blah, 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 blah. We said enough, enough, and uh, led the charge. Uh, that's propaganda. <laughs> that's not an answer to the question Marr asked him, right? But anyway, that was Johnson's first. That was his opening salvo. Marvellous bit of theatre. So Marr tried again. What are we trying to do there? What is our objective there? Uh, I think it's important to understand the limits of what we're trying to do. We're this not is not trying about to end the war. That's right, Andrew. And and I think that this is not going to. We must be honest. This is not going to turn the tide of the conflict in Syria. Uh, one can hope that it encourages the Russians to get Assad uh, to the uh, negotiating table in Geneva to get a political process properly going. But that is uh, that is, as it mm. were, an extra. The primary purpose is to say no to the use of barbaric chemical weapons. And I want to come r directly back to that. But before we do, I guess the question on a lot of people's lips today is, is that it now? Because President Trump has talked about being locked and loaded. Are we locked and loaded if Assad uses chemical weapons in a week's time or a month's time or three months' time? Will we do the same thing again? Is this the beginning of a process or is it the end of something? Well, we must hope that it uh, is a deterrent. Obviously, hope, that's, yes. that's, of course. And I believe it's been a successful mission. I believe it's a, a timely, appropriate, and uh, commensurate uh, mission. Uh, we but, can't but, tell. But if we in can't three tell weeks how, we get a chemical attack, we can't tell how the Assad regime uh, will respond. Uh, I believe it was the right response mm -hmm. to, to what happened uh, in Douma. Uh, the evidence was overwhelming, as your uh, correspond as, as the uh, as, as people were discussing just now on your on your the show Times, yeah. on the Sunday Times, the the. The, the smell of chlorine, the, the sight of that uh, regime helicopter in the air. No one else has helicopters. No one else would be capable of dropping a barrel bomb of, of chlorine in that way. The evidence uh, was absolutely overwhelmingly uh, overwhelming. It was timely. It was uh, proportionate. Nobody has helicopters. Nobody else has helicopters. I think Base Ninja made that comment on Twitter earlier on. It's preposterous to lie through your teeth on national television like that. These head-chopping, sunny nutcases that we've um, armed, trained, um, I get rid of that, have been given everything. 
that they need. Everything from the latest and greatest Toyota four-wheel drive vans, guns, um, rocket launchers, missiles, everything. There's no doubt they've, they've had air support. Again, there's no doubt they've had air support from the the usual criminal cabal, the Israelis, ourselves, the Yankees and the Saudis. There's no doubt in my mind. It's just preposterous garbage. <laughs> right. Right. ISIS are finished. Assad has the country back. That can't be allowed to happen. Johnson is saying it's not regime change, but it is because Russia has stopped Syria, excuse me, Russia has stopped the West dead in its tracks. As Dick Black said earlier, Assad won, hence the stories of chemical weapon deployment and mass murder. That's where all of this is coming from. Now, do you remember that interview that Johnson did with German television where he said he had been personally assured by the top brass at Porton Down Chemical Weapon Storage Facility in Salisbury, he had been personally assured that the Novichok agent used against the Skripals had definitely come from Russia. Do you remember that? He said this categorically. He was definite about it. And then the top brass at Porton Down came out and said they had no idea where it had come from and they contradicted what Johnson had actually said. Well, Andrew Marr, to his credit, given the opportunity, he brought this up with Johnson today. All right, let's turn to um, back to, to, to the Scripple poisoning case. Yes. Um, the evidence has been suggested uh, being very, very strong. We heard the interview from the head of Porton Down when he was less c categorical, perhaps, than we expected about the origins of the Novichok. You were much criticised for an interview you gave to German television in which you said you'd had absolute categorical assurances from Porton Down. What yes. exactly well, did you mean? Yes, I'm, well, thank you for, for, for asking that. Because well, he's that delighted. Because happened over Easter, as, as, as I recall. And uh, I was being very clear, I thought I was being very clear to... Uh, Deutsche Welle, the, the German program, which is that uh, Porton Down told us in absolutely no uncertain terms that this was a military grade uh, Novichok. So they, they knew what agent it was. They didn't of a just... type of a, 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 and furthermore, of a type that had been produced and stockpiled in the in the former Soviet Union. And, they, and, I, and I said, "Is that really? Are you sure about that?" And they said they were absolutely certain that that was uh, what it was. Now, uh, it is not the business of, of Porton Down, and I don't know whether it's even possible uh, for them to identify the origin of a, uh, mm, a, of a you know, of a, like, as, any more than you might be able to identify the origin of a sample of, of sulfuric acid. But as the OPCW uh, confirmed just uh, this week, last week, uh, it mm. was indeed military-grade Novichok uh, of a type that, uh, as I said to you on, the, on your show and a while back, had been stockpiled likely for assassination purposes by Russia in the last 10 years. And had you, so, seen, sorry, so, had you seen the evidence about all the, the allegations from the security services about it being tested on door handles yeah. and the scribbles being pursued for five years as well? I, I, at that stage, we hadn't seen that particular a piece of, uh, of evidence. Marr is a total joke, isn't he? He didn't press him on his definite statement to German television that he had been told personally and assured personally by the Porton Down people that the agent had come from Russia. Marr just neglected to really drill down into him and moved on to talking about other things. That's pretty rubbish, but I suppose it's what you'd expect of the BBC. 12 minutes to midday as I do this live. This is Sunday View with uh, myself, Richie Allen. Going to take a very quick break. When we come back, we'll hear a bit from the Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn. I'll read some more tweets as well. A lot of tweets coming in today. It is a, um, it's a gloomy old day here this Sunday, but um, it's nice. It's nice to have a so I like so I, I used to hate Sundays when I was younger. Maybe it was school, maybe. The thoughts of going back to school on the Monday. I didn't like Sundays, but I have a much broader appreciation of Sundays these days. So I'm looking forward to the afternoon. Right, quick break, back in a minute, and we'll hear from Jeremy Corbyn. Introducing the H2O app, a powerful water structure and application that programs vibrational energies into water through the use of different sound frequencies. Once programmed, the use of water for drinking, cooking, bathing, 
Give it to your friends and colleagues or spread it around the garden. The list goes on. It's not just water that the app can be used for either. It's great for programming crystals too. The H2O app is free to download and is available on both Android and Apple platforms. For further information, go to h2oapp.com online. Have you lost access to important data from a computer hard drive, mobile phone, or other storage device? Maybe you have a broken hard drive containing years of information, or a smartphone that no longer works from which you'd like the pictures, movies, and chats recovered. If you would like to recover data from any type of digital device, including desktop and laptop computers, external hard drives, cameras, smartphones, NAS, and RAID servers, then contact Data Clinic today at dataclinic.co.uk now. There's a place high in the mountains of Spain, a sanctuary where souls gather from all around the globe to learn about themselves and experience powerful changes in the way we see our world. They become awakened to their gifts and their power to heal others. Become part of this ever-growing worldwide family of unique, pure energy healing practitioners. Discover how amazing you truly are. Go to www www.markbayerski.com It could just change your life forever. The Richie Allen Show relies on your support. Go to richieallen.co.uk and set up a monthly donation today. Right, welcome back to the programme. Sunday View, we're in the last leg of Sunday View. Thanks for all the tweets today, by the way. I really appreciate them. Thank you for them. A number of you making reference to the fact that Jeremy, excuse me, not Jeremy Corbyn, not at all, but Boris Johnson, of course, Mr. Bullingdon Club, would have um, burnt £50 notes in the faces of homeless people. Yes, he did do that. That's not speculation, that's a fact. It's a, it's a very well-known initiation ritual into the Bullingdon Club, these idiots, these toffee-nosed muppets who go to schools like Eton, wankers. I'm sorry to use a word like that on a Sunday. I nearly got through the programme without swearing as well, but uh, horrible, horrible people. How you could see somebody in such a desperate situation, you know. I can understand people walking on, and I can. I don't virtue signal here. I, I can understand people who walk away. A lot of people are confused. Uh, a lot of people don't have any money, and a lot of people don't know what to do. And they see people in a wretched situation, and they're not able to deal with it. I really believe that. I've seen it. Then you have people like the future Mrs. Allen um, will spend hours with people because she loves people, loves life, loves people, chatting away with people. And then you have guys like me and you and people like me and you. If you've got a couple of uh, quid in your pocket, you'll generally give it to somebody and say, look, get a sandwich, get a cup of tea, job done, kind of a thing. What you'll never do is take money out of your pocket and burn it in the faces of somebody like that. <laughs> Wonderful people, huh? Wonderful people. Hi to Martin in Spain, to Devlin Mallow, how you doing, Devlin? Uh, good morning to you and thanks for the kind um, words about the show. It's not much of a show today. <laughs> it really, I, all I'm doing really is is just um, just chatting about what the, we, we've not really dug into some of the other stories in the papers. We're just basically having a listen to what has been said by others today. Daniel Ford, good morning, Daniel. You're not the only one who has a problem with Sunday, says Daniel. Yes, your problem with Sundays might be different to mine, my friend. You might have had a night on the tiles, maybe. Maybe it did. Right, let's them hear from the Labour leader, the leader of the opposition, Jeremy Corbyn, also on the Andrew Marr show today. Um, what was Johnson's, or what was, uh, Johnson Christ, what was Corbyn saying? Well, to cut it down a bit, he said Parliament should have had a say before any missile strikes were launched. He's always said that. He also talked, interestingly enough, about the introduction of an act called the War Powers Act, presumably where no Prime Minister could ever take military action of any sort, and they wouldn't be able to do that without parliamentary approval, so that would be the War Powers Act. He then talked about what he'd have done, or more importantly, what he would like to see Jeremy Corbyn. What I would like is a vote which outlines a process that could now happen. That is giving the OPCW the chance to um, go in and fully investigate everything, including the um, debris from the bombing attack, but also a very strong steer to our government to now go back to the UN and promote a resolution and work might and main 
to bring Russia and the United States together on this so that we do get a political process in Syria as well, of course, as the removal of chemical weapons, which was done after 2013 when Lavrov and Kerry reached an agreement which had a big effect. After all, several hundred tons of chemical weapons were destroyed as a result of that process. It can be done, it's hard work, and it takes patience, but surely that is better than the danger of escalation of this conflict into a proxy war between the US and Russia over the skies of Syria. Yeah, they got rid of their chemical weapons, Jeremy said. The West knew this. Jeremy won't elaborate now the way I'm elaborating. The West did know this, and this is why we got all these crazy lies about chemical weapons being imported from North Korea. See, the whole story has more holes in it than a sponge. Here's more from uh, Jeremy Corbyn, the Labour leader. You mentioned the OPCW there, the Organisation for Prevention of yes, Chemical Weapons. Now, do you accept that when they reported last year that, that Assad was responsible for a chemical attack in 2017, they were right? I have no problem with uh, their reporting, their investigation or the quality of it, but they must be given the chance to do it now. There is evidence, of course, very strong evidence, about the use of chlorine, which is not itself a banned substance because it's so easy to make, but clearly as a weapon it is illegal. Uh, that has been used by a number of parties in the conflict, but there's quite clear evidence there. The OPCW must be given the chance to report on it. They are, after all, on their way to Duma. They may even be there now. They are there now, I think, and we've got reports in the papers of the smell of chlorine coming from the, Indeed, the clothes of children and so Indeed, forth. Sir. If they came back and said, yes, this was Assad's regime, there's one helicopter above it, and this was a chemical attack against international law, would you then be in favour of using missiles? To I would then say, confront Assad with that, that evidence, mm. confront any other group that may be fingered because of that, any other, maybe, I'm saying maybe, I don't know, and then say they must now come in and remove and destroy those weapons as they did in 2013 and 2015. But the wider context has to be promotion of a political solution and a ceasefire. We cannot go on. 400,000 people have died in Syria. Two million are external but refugees. But nobody died as a result of these attacks and it, they may have <clears> degraded Assad's chemical weapons facilities really substantially. There may be other ones we don't know about. There may be a fallout from it. But the point is also of the legality of doing it. Because if we want to get the moral high ground around the world, as a member of the Security Council, as a, um, a country with a long tradition of international involvement, shall we yeah. say, then we have to abide by international law. And I say to the Foreign Secretary, I say to the Prime Minister, mm. where is the legal basis for this? The legal basis would have to be... Humanitarian, they say. Well, it would have to be self-defence or the authority of the UN Security Council. The humanitarian intervention is a legally debatable concept mm -hmm. at the present time. It isn't legally debatable, debatable even, it's illegal. Look, I posted on Twitter yesterday and on the website, a serious letter that I wrote to the superintendent of Westminster Police outlining that what May and her cabinet did was illegal and they should be investigated for it and if necessary they should be arrested. There was nothing funny or ironic about the letter I wrote. It was deadly serious and I do understand that one or two of our listeners contacted the police station and were basically told to go away or go to your own local police station and make a complaint which is ridiculous because May's, May would come under the jurisdiction of that Westminster police station. Anyway, look, of course nobody thought for a minute that anybody would ever question, let alone arrest Theresa May. Nobody thought that. I didn't think that at all. It was more a symbolic thing to do. It was more of a symbolic thing to do just to show them refusing to do their jobs, refusing point blank to do their jobs. A British citizen has committed a crime. She admitted that crime on national television in front of millions of people and then brazenly said that she'd be prepared to commit that crime again. Of course she should be investigated, but it'll, it'll never happen. The letter was symbolic and one or two people said, why did you bother, Richie? Fair enough. Because, as I said, for reasons of symbolism and symbolism only. That's it for Sunday View. Thanks for listening to it. Look after yourselves and one another. Have a great Sunday afternoon. 
Uh, I'm going to try and uh, get a little bit of fresh air at some stage, leaving it with some Bruce the Boss Springsteen. This is Human Touch. I'll be back with you tomorrow, Monday, live at 7pm UK time. Thank you for listening. Thank you for tweeting. Until tomorrow, bye for now. Bye now.